Hey Team BCN, thank you so much for joining me today. Samantha Kraft, licensed clinical social worker out of the Hazard office, and Susan Houston, bereavement counselor and licensed clinical social worker, also out of the Hazard office, joins me today so we can get to know them a little bit, learn about the work that they are doing to help children affected by the recent flooding in Eastern Kentucky, and also talk about some ways to navigate all the emotions that go along with the holiday season. Samantha, Susan, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. For sure, for sure. So Samantha, how long have you worked at Bluegrass Care Navigators? Um, I've been here for going on 12 years now. Wow. Susan, what about you? Uh, March will be 13 years. Okay. So you guys came with a, a year apart from each other. Mm -hmm. So that's really cool. I, as you may know, I've been here all of two months, I think. So very new. I admire the longevity that you have put into the work that you do. One of the words that was mentioned here to me in my very early days is that people had to be called to spend their life in healthcare, especially in the field of hospice. When did you first know you wanted to be a social worker? And then when did that, that desire to be a social worker transition into the hospice field? Samantha, we can start with you. I decided, I didn't decide until probably my first semester of college that I wanted to be a social worker. I've always felt the need to want to help others or be there for others to, to listen to them and just be the support person for my friends and family. And then it being a student helped transition me into hospice because that's how I got into the hospice here at Hazard. I was a student with them first and through my master's degree. Okay, very nice. Susan, how did you enter the social work world? Well, I have I, I saw your question and I kind of when I looked at the email and I kind of chuckled because I always say I was a social worker in third grade. I just didn't know what that <laughs> was uh -huh. uh, because even even then, not to certainly promote myself, but people would just come to me, as, as Sam said, family and friends at that young age. And I, I didn't know what social work was, um, but I always, always wanted to help other people. And my dad was a coal miner, but couldn't afford to send me to college um, out of high school. So I went to work at a little department store in Neon. After five years of that, I thought, I'm going to go to school. I, I, I just have to go to school. So I did. And they asked me, first thing, what do you want to be? And I'm like, I don't know. I just want to help people. So they said, OK, let's put you in the human services field. And so from there, it went to social work. As it was that I transitioned to hospice, I worked with outpatient. I, I, I started out as a home health social worker. Um, and then I went to adult psych. And then I went to children's mental health. And I did that for almost 11 years. And a friend said that there was a position with hospice and I thought mm, that that might be that might be my next calling and so I contacted Pam Dixon um, the most wonderful supervisor in the world and, <laughs> yeah. uh, <laughs> so here I am yeah well, long story I apologize <laughs> no no that's what we're here for Samantha how did you come to work at Bluegrass Care Navigators um, I had transitioned to a student. I did my practicum hours with hospice here um, when I was finishing my master's degree. Okay. So you just kind of from a like student internship type role transitioned to a full-time employee? Yes. That's really cool. So you have worked nowhere else um, since since becoming a social worker, right? Right. No, nope. I've just been hospice since graduation. I think that's really, really awesome. I think that's awesome. Susan, we can start with you on my next question. How would you describe your role as a social worker? Or maybe a better way to put it is, what do you see as your mission as a social worker? Well, to give the knee-jerk response, it's to help others. But in, in this specific role, Heidi, I, I, and I may have shared this with you when we talked before, but it for me, it's just so humbling to walk alongside people at the most vulnerable time in their life when they've lost somebody that they love. I want I want to be able to help people through that and and touch. I, 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 work, I have always worked from the standpoint that 
people have the answers and and an effective therapist, an effective social worker just helps them tap into that and come up with ways that they with the strength that they already possess. And so I like to think that that we as hospice social workers and bereavement counselors can can do that for the people that we serve. Absolutely. Samantha, how would you describe your role or your mission as a social worker? I'm going to echo Susan on that because I feel my mission is, as well is to just help others through difficult times in their lives because we've all been through difficult times personally, whether that be loss of a loved one or a traumatic event or something and, and have either had somebody there to help us or have not. So I want to be the person that's there to help people through events or through their feelings, through tragedy, um, because they may not have nobody else. Right. So I feel that's what I hope to do. Yeah. And it sounds like both of you, other people may have recognized that gifting in you even before you did and went to school. So one of the things that they asked me as part of my onboarding process um, is why Bluegrass Care Navigators and why now? So I'm curious to learn, Samantha, we can start with you on this question. Why Bluegrass Care Navigators and why now for you? Well, when I was choosing an organization to do my practicum with for my master's, I had narrowed it down to two. And my mother had actually been the one to convince me to try hospice. She told me she felt that that would be good for me to help others. And I've always been more medically inclined to want to help that way, too. So my mother helped me decide that I should choose the hospice route. And then being a student here, I just fell in love with it. And I mm-hmm. felt that it's that's what I, I need to do. And it's my calling. Yeah. Yeah. Susan, what about you? Well, as as I said, um, I certainly had heard of hospice being in the home health field. But when when a friend said there's this bereavement counselor position open, I just felt like that that was just what I needed to do. Like Sam, and I I think we can all I think we can all just echo Sam's words of falling in love with hospice. People often ask, and I'm sure they do, Sam, as well, how can you do that work? And I'm like, you know, really, it's not, it doesn't feel like work. It really, it it feels like a humanitarian effort. It's it's God's work. I'm just trying to follow that guide. Yes, absolutely. So. Susan, you and I talked about this for an article that I wrote that's also on our website, but one of the things that you and Sam and several others are doing is visiting 10 schools in the areas hit hardest by the flooding to help children process their feelings with art and story. Would um, would one of you, I don't care which one, um, share about your most recent visit or one that particularly stands out to you? I'm going to uh, allude to Sam on that. I, I'm, I'm happy to answer that, but we did talk about that and and it's it's just meant so much, but Sam is a very vital part of that, and she's been such a, a vital part of uh, resource planning for the whole entire hospice region here. Um, so I'm going to let Miss Sam answer that question, if that's okay. Yeah, that's fine. Sam, please, would you mind sharing with us? Well, we and we have some more school planning coming up as well been very humbling from the experiences we've had and and been able to go to provide to these kids and even to the adults that were in the room with us, the the aides, the teachers, the principals, the counselors, school staff, everybody. Just a few things that that stand out in my mind. Me and Susan was at one of the local schools doing a, a resource group with them and the kids, multiple kids in the classroom had lost their home during the flood. They'd lost loved ones during the flood. Some of them had drew their family members being washed away in the water, their animals, their pets being washed away in the water. And that's the first time that they had actually got to express their feelings through artwork. Many of them had told us so. That was great for them to be able to do that. And another instance that really has stood out to me with grief and what we've worked with with these children is we, me and Susan and others, had visited a local campground that is FEMA campers sheltering people that's lost their homes. And a little six-year-old girl had drew a picture 
and she was telling us what she was most thankful for. And she had told me she was thankful for the power pole. And I, of course, you know, I was, you know, wasn't really sure what, what she was meaning. So I said, why, why were you thankful for the power pole? And she had told me that she had watched it save her home, that the, her home, what she lived in a, in a trailer, the water was flooding and they were on the hillside. They walked up the mountain to get away and out of the water. And she watched her trailer being carried away by the water and it had wrapped around the power pole. So she was thankful that the power pole had saved her home. So it's just, it's real humbling. And we just love to be able to do these for these kids and these families. And we hope to, to be able to do more. And I wish we could do more, but uh, we're, I'm very thankful that, that we're able to do what we are. Mm, absolutely. And just hearing you share that story, the thing that stands out to me is that this child could find something to be grateful for in the midst of something so, so traumatic and difficult. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So Susan, if you wouldn't mind, would you tell me what a typical school visit for, um, for these children affected by the flooding, what that looks like? We meet with, it's been interesting. Some schools want the entire school involved and some feel like it's the elementary school kids and uh, or the I'm sorry the like K through five um, and then some say K through three so but the gist of it is that we meet with them as a classroom and we explain where where we who we're with and what we're doing and talking about feelings and just alluding to the difficult time they've been through since July and they all get that I think don't you Sam Um, and so we start with uh, having them identify feelings and Mm. that's been really really awesome in that most kids will say and do say sad happy um, excited um but it went to devastated, just just feelings that normally kids don't identify. And those are older kids. So we, we start with that um, because kids have such a difficult time of identifying what they're feeling. And so we read a book and the book that we have most read is entitled In My Heart. And it's a entire book of feelings and it's a beautiful book as well and then through this grant the schools that we meet with get that book um, whichever book we choose to read Um, and then we do an art activity and we're doing mandalas to teach them the importance of how to be calm, how to express their feelings through colors. And they just have all just taken to that. I think I shared with you earlier when when uh, after the first school that Sam and I worked at, as I was leaving that evening, the kids were lined up to catch the bus. And every one of them had their little mandalas in their hand. And, and um, I thought, OK. This is this has made it all worthwhile. It meant something to them. So mm-hmm. yeah. um, I think that's pretty typical. Sam, can you can you add anything to that? No, I, I think that's usual. The, the outline of what we usually do. OK, that's that's a beautiful process just to give space for these children through story and art to to be able to express themselves, you know, when it's not the easiest thing for children, especially, but really, I think a lot of people struggle expressing their emotions and identifying them. Yes. And and if I could just interject here, um, and I'm sure Sam picked up on this too. It was really interesting to see the adults in the room. Sam had mentioned that teachers and counselors and resource folks were there, but they really got into identifying their their feelings too. They would raise their hand when we'd talk about a particular feeling. And and maybe I just read a lot into it, but it seemed as though they 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 were glad to identify that they too felt that specific emotion. And um, yeah. that was just really neat. Mm-hmm. I know from my own experience, there's a lot of power even in just naming what I'm feeling so that then I can hopefully deal with it in an appropriate way. 
You've talked about, you both have talked about this a little bit, but Sam, I was wondering if you can speak to what you've seen in your work, maybe not just in the schools this time, although it might be specifically to the work you're doing in the schools, but what the power of story and art, how that helps children process their emotions. Well, what we've seen just with the schools or with with kids I've worked with is it allows them to get it out in a different manner. So a lot of the children sometimes that, that we have spoke with have not spoke it out loud, have not talked about it, have not wrote about it, especially has has not drew pictures or, you know, colored things and t- in that kind of manner. So it's just a different form for them to get it out. And a lot of times they don't want to talk about it out loud. They would rather write it down or they would rather draw a picture. So I think it's good that we're helping show them and tell them that there's different ways to get their emotions out and not just one certain way that they can do that. Mm -hmm. Susan, do you have anything to add to that? No, I I certainly agree with with Sam, but I, I am thinking about a little girl that had lost her mother that I worked with in one of the schools and a big, she was in um, first grade and reading, she loved to color and kids can generally, if they have something hands-on to do, they're more open to express their feelings. So she did a lot of coloring and art and I would read stories and she would, she would look up at times and and nod. But at one point I in whatever book I was reading to her, it used the word die. And she got out of her chair and went underneath the table. And she said, That's what happened to my mommy. But we were able to talk about that. And so oftentimes we adults don't want to hear that word die. We use euphem euphemisms. Mm-hmm. Um because we're not comfortable saying the word died or dead or uh, again, I, I think I think Sam Sam spoke exactly why why art and is a powerful way of expressing feelings. For sure, for sure. How have you seen these visits help these children find hope? Sam, we can start with you and then Susan, if you want to share anything else to go along with Sam's answer, that would be great. I noticed, like Susan has said, when we read the books to the children in my heart book, when it would go through the emotions and we would talk to them about who's had this emotion or who's feeling this emotion today, whether that be, you know, angry or sad or hopeful. And a lot of them raised their hands and they would look around at each other. And, you know, I noticed that they weren't alone or that there was others that would feel in this. Or when we would talk about ways that they would cope when they was angry, what would they do? One would say, oh, I would play basketball or or I would write in my diary or different things like that. And then another one would chime in, oh, I do that too. Or I, I enjoy doing that. So they kind of join together in that manner as a group and realizing that they're not alone and there's hope. And I think that's important for kids and adults to realize. Absolutely. Susan, do you have anything to add? It's okay if you don't. I just want to give both of you a chance to share. Well, um, I I agree with with Sam again. It certainly normalizes when they can look around and see their peers. Kids struggle with, I want to be different, but I don't want to stand out, you know, so Uh that's kind of conflictual for them. But I I certainly agree with, with Sam. And I am not an artist by any means, but I think just the beauty of art gives a sense of hope and life to children and adults, those kids, no matter if their little mandala was waterlogged or not, but especially those who saw all of the different colors blend together and the beauty, and they were just in awe of that. Don't you agree, Sam? Yes. Yeah. Um, so I think it just, in that beauty, I think there is there is hope for children. Um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So you mentioned the adults in the room participating in the identifying of the emotions too, and you're giving these children tools to process their feelings that will hope, hopefully follow them even as as they grow. I mean, how do you hope that this helps them as they grow into adulthood? 
Susan, we can start with you. I've been going to Sam first the last few times. So <laughs> That's, okay. That's okay. I'm always glad to take my hat off to Miss Samantha. But studies have, have shown, and it doesn't take rocket science to figure this out, but if children don't learn to express their feelings um, and talk about the issues that have impacted them, the trauma they may have witnessed, that bleeds over into adulthood, into their relationships and how they deal with relationships. So my hope is that in the work that we do, that we are planting that seed like, gee, it's it's okay to it's okay to feel this. And we stress that, you know, feelings are just feelings. And every time we would ask one of the kids or the, the a group of kids, is anger a good feeling or a bad feeling? And they would all say a bad feeling. So we were able to teach them that, no, it's just a feeling like anything else, but it's how we express that and the, import, the importance of expressing it in in a a healthier way. So I hope that that's what they can carry into adulthood. Yes, absolutely. Sam, do you have anything to add to that? Just to reiterate what she said, just that it's important for them to learn how to cope and express their feelings now um, as they go through life and experience more, maybe more tragedy or more heartache. And a lot of times adults, we as adults don't even know how to handle our feelings. So it's just a good good reminder and refresher for everybody. Yes, for sure. Because it took me until I think the last couple of years to just accept a feeling as a feeling and not identify anger as a bad feeling that had to yeah. be. Yeah, that yeah. took that took a long time. And I've been an adult for a long time. So if children can learn this early, they'll they'll be way better off. So shifting gears a little bit but still dealing with some of the same things. So we're all entering the holiday season and especially for those children and their families, but for the rest of us too, it is not always a joyful time. How can we navigate the stress and sadness and grief loss that, you know, this is in quotes, that the most wonderful time of the year also brings? How do we, how do we navigate that? Um, Sam, we can start with you this time. I think kind of like we've already discussed is just, reiterating and that it's okay to have all these feelings and that it is okay to have them at the same time. So just because it is the most wonderful time of the year does not mean that we can't be sad during the holidays or does not mean that we just can't can't be upset and that it's okay to allow ourselves to have these feelings and work through these feelings and then also enjoy the holidays too. It's definitely making space. It's a both and type of thing. Like there's joy and sadness and learning to hold both. Right, Susan? Yes, definitely. Definitely. And and Nancy Kramer, a bereavement counselor in Northern Kentucky and I are doing a holiday grief group. And we use this quote by an author that she and I both love, whose name is Gary Rowe. And if I could just read this, to, sure. it's just real brief. But he says, I think of the feel-good holiday classics like Miracle on 34th Street. It is a wonderful life and White Christmas. It's interesting that the backstories of these films include tragedy, illness, economic disaster, war, death, depression, and the difficulty of aging. That's why they are classics. They give us hope. They are about overcoming our losses. Though life is tough, love and goodness can still win out. And I just love that. And one of my favorite people in the world is Helen Keller. And she has this quote that says, what we have what we have once enjoyed, we can never lose. All that we love deeply becomes a part of us. And so while our hearts may be broken, especially during the Christmas holidays, it's all about family and gaiety and our hearts are broken. So it's it's helping it's helping people realize that you can still hold on to those memories, even though they break your heart. And as Sam was saying, Um, If we share those openly, some may make us cry, but others will make us laugh. And it's okay to do both. It's okay whatever we feel. Mm. But I just encourage people to be kind to themselves during this time. Mm. Mm -hmm. The work that you guys are doing, I mean, just hearing some of your stories, 
I mean, my heart is breaking just hearing them. And so um, I really appreciate the work that you're doing. And so I was just wondering, like on difficult days, you're giving people kind of the gift of expressing their feelings, but also the gift to know that they aren't carrying that alone. So you kind of take that on a little bit. Can you tell me a story that keeps you going when it would just maybe be easier to quit that day or like, you're like, maybe I can't handle anymore. Sam, if you wouldn't mind to share first. Yeah, um, actually, I had a, a visit yesterday that was towards the end of the day. And it was a little, I have an elderly uh, lady and her little elderly husband. And she had told me, she was like, you do so much and, and you try to help me the best you can. She said, you can just call me your Nana. She said, I'm just going to be your <laughs> Nana. <laughs> and, um, she said, because I think you would treat your Nana like you treat me. And I said, well. I think I would too, and I, and I want to always try to help you. So it's times like that that, you know, rewarms my heart and, and, and helps me get through the hard days. Yeah, yeah, because you both have been in this work for over a decade. So to keep going to manage your own self-care, yeah, you need, you need heartwarming times like that. Yes. Yeah, Susan, what about you? It's just I get so much from my clients who trust me enough you know we're very private people in eastern i say Mm -hmm. eastern kentucky i'm sure that's all over but especially in eastern kentucky Mm -hmm. um and so for them to risk themselves in coming in to share it's just taught me the importance of listening because that like sam they will say You've just helped me so much. And, and I will question at the end of the day, I don't know what I I don't know what I did. Um, I don't have these great words of wisdom or but I have I feel that I have heart and good listening ears um, to, to help people. But I, I guess one one story would be I have this elderly lady and she just wants to keep coming in and coming in and coming in. And, you know, at some point we we have to discharge. And so we've been having that conversation. And so she told me last she told me last week that she needs a grief counselor to help her get over losing her grief counselor. So <laughs> that, that, that was a that was pretty heady to hear. Yeah. Um, and and like Sam, you know, that gives me to know that I've made some small difference mm-hmm. in somebody's life that just gives me the strength to go on. It's not easy what what we do, what all of us with hospice do. It's not easy. No. But it is so rewarding um, and humbling. That's that's just the best word to describe it. It's just so humbling to be able to be a small part of that. Absolutely. So I have one more question that I'll ask each of you. But before I do that, is there anything else you'd like to say that I didn't know to ask you? I think sometimes, Heidi, we we learn from those we're trying to help too, and we see their strength in terrible circumstances. And that gives us the, the strength to even in our own personal lives to, to cope with things. But early on, one of my first clients was he was 92 and had been taking care of his little spouse and then hospice came in and he taught me and and I passed that on to others he said I did everything for her I sat by her bed and held her hand but I didn't talk to her and you know she was here till she wasn't here Mm -hmm. and so I encourage when when I go in prior to a death, I encourage people and I encourage my friends and family continue continue to talk because they're still here. You know, uh-huh. their bodies are different, but they are still here. So just just knowing that we get as much from our clients and patients as hopefully they get from us is is just wonderful. Yeah. For sure. Because the show is about getting to know our team members, what is one thing that others may not know about you? Sam, we can start with you. I love the outdoors and I love to travel. Awesome. I don't do it as much as I'd like. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think any of us get to do it as much as we like. Susan, what about you? I'm a guitar player. Really? I am a back porch <laughs> picker, as we say in the mountains, but yeah, I play guitar. 
I love it. I, I don't think it. many people know that that's not anything I share with people because I'm not <laughs> very good at it. But Well, thank you both so much for your time today and for sharing. I really appreciate you guys and the work that you're doing. Thank you, Heidi. We appreciate you taking the time to do this.